Hey everyone, welcome back to Behind the Bastards. And I have some bad news for you all kind of at the start of this episode. Um, starting in like 2021, kind of late, you know, early pandemic period, uh, I started chatting with, uh, with, with a, a good friend of mine, Cormac McCarthy, about bringing one of his books to life in the way he'd always intended, which was by having me read Blood Meridian in my award-winning Boston accent uh, in its entirety. We, uh, we, we finished, you know, kind of our discussions right before he, he tragically passed earlier this year. Sophie and I recorded the whole thing. We were about to release it as a surprise, but um, we've, as a result of the, uh, the writers and now the actors strike in solidarity, decided to delete the entirety of Boston Blood Meridian. Um, so, you know, I, I'm very sorry. I know a lot of you were looking forward to this. Uh, and all I can say is that if you want to do something about this and, and force us to release it, David Zaslav's home address is <laughs> Beverly Hills, California. So, you know, I don't I'm not telling you to do anything. Just just think about it. That's where his sixty five million dollar Beverly Hills mansion is. Uh, don't also, loop me into this weird crime you're doing right now, Sophie. It's not a crime because the mansion that he bought used to belong to the other Robert Evans. So I'm allowed to read it on air. There is no other Robert Evans. You are the <laughs> Thank only you, Sophie. one. It is Thank just you, Sophie. You. Speaking of other people who are the only example of their kind, Sarah Marshall. <gasps> Hello. Actually, oh my this God, is, it's true. We're both doppelgangers. We, we are both doppelgangers. It is interesting that we both have a, a famous person who utilized our name that is involved in Hollywood. Uh, it is. And I. it's also weird to be the real person, the non-Hollywood person. You are the real version. Yeah. And yet I'm the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I, not I, in my I did heart. not say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> no. Every time I come across a copy of that movie at a red box, I kick it. So I'm I'm oh, doing my part. Solidarity. You are Sarah, really doing your part. That's all I ask for. <laughs> yeah. You you are you are one of the most accomplished podcasters in in the biz. Uh a real uh uh I was going to like give you a nickname based on a famous podcaster, but most of them Ooh. are terrible people, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. I'm a real Marin Real era. Rogan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, you, uh, you, you, you do some of the best podcasts in the business, and you also live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, how how are you doing today? Yeah. I'm so good. Yes, this is an all Portland show, which I love. I especially love it when I meet people who say, do you live in New York or L.A.? And I say, Portland. It's like the third secret answer. <laughs> and their no answer is always, oh. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a, yeah. They say, it's, oh. And then they say, and where are you from? And you say, Portland. And they say, oh. <laughs> See, that's different. Because there are, that this is, uh, Portland's a little weird to me in that. And that like, mm -hmm. uh, unlike all of the other West Coast cities, you ask anyone where they're from and it's anywhere but the West Coast. But in Portland, mm -hmm. Some people actually come from here, which is surprising to me. It's a, I mean, it's a great city to stick around in. I feel like Pittsburgh I is agree. the same way. It's like, I don't know. And it's the, you have a really nice quality of life here. I yeah, think despite I like it. The, yeah. I, I'm so happy I, you like it. It's thrilling. I, and uh, <laughs> I was just juicing a watermelon before uh, I, we started because it is watermelon time. There are little signs for Hermiston melons up uh, oh. on, in our streets where you can go buy them from a truck. And uh, it's watermelon time. I'm pretty happy. I had, I had watermelon for lunch. Thank you so that, much. Uh, Honestly, I'm, I'm extremely time. hungover right now. So a watermelon sounds great. I, I do. And I, I'm sorry for telling you this, Sarah, but uh, the AI will will be able to take your line where you said that you were just juicing a watermelon and turn that into a conversation with Joe Rogan about steroids. So, uh, <laughs> I, I do apologize. And we all have to deal with that. <laughs> we all yeah, have to deal is, with that. And apparently, uh, and apparently, or as I call, <laughs> I was just going to say, apparently you only get paid for one day of your work and then they'll use it forever. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, they juice you and then they throw you away. Uh, yeah, Joe Rogan, or as I call him, the guy from news radio. The guy from news radio. Um, I love that. Yeah, it's good because we all needed a shorthand that we could use to simultaneously refer to Joe Rogan and Andy Dick. 
Um, <laughs> I also these are great jokes for three percent of our audience. Why um, is it also that like, and the, here's a, a joke for that three percent as well? I can't believe that a podcast that has <laughs> truly changed American society. Oh yeah, uh, has come from a news radio alum, and that it wasn't Dave Foley. Who I think could yeah. have, Solid if point. he had that size of a following, I would be okay with that, I think. Yeah, I would have been okay with Phil Hartman having that big of a following. Oh my God, can you I imagine know. Phil Tragic. Hartman is alive and Joe Rogan is, you know, the other one? <laughs> I, t- <laughs> I was just going to say, wouldn't it be nice if Phil Hartman was alive? But yeah, that, that does really <laughs> complete it, the wish. Speaking of tragedy, oh, how good. do you feel about kidnapping, Sarah? Um, I am always ready to talk about a kidnapping as oh, is good. my okay. anxiety well, brain at one in the morning when I'm on Wikipedia. So this is much better than that. that that's good. Cause we're kind of, our subject for this week is pretty focused on the anxiety brain and how it relates to paranoid conspiracy theories about kidnapping. Um, because it turns out that's a real problem. Uh, and we're going to start by talking about kind of the deadliest manifestation of that problem. On mm. June 16th, 2023, Phoebe Howard Copas, a 48-year-old woman from Tompkinsville, Kentucky, flew to El Paso, Texas to hang out with her boyfriend. Upon arrival, she got into an Uber driven by a 52-year-old man named Daniel Piedra Garcia. Uh, his niece later described him as a hardworking and funny guy who had an instinctive ability to lift other people up when he was in a bad mood. Piedras was the sole breadwinner for his family and had started driving for Uber after recovering from an injury at a previous job. Um, He started driving Copas to her boyfriend's place. She was not familiar with El Paso. She had been one or two times before, and she got spooked because she saw a sign for Juarez, Mexico, which convinced her, for some reason, that she was about to be kidnapped and trafficked across the border. Now, El Paso, if you've never been, is the sister city or sibling city or whatever to Juarez. Uh, they, they're they effectively suburbs of each other, right? Like Juarez mm-hmm. and El Paso are basically the same city with a border in between them. So seeing signs for Juarez while you're in El Paso, not a weird experience. But right, Copas, they're all over the place because you're it's super constant, near it. Yeah, because it's, it, it's right there. It's also a very pretty yeah. city. <laughs> it's a great city. We're, we're, we'll talk about that. But Copas gets freaked yeah. out. So she pulls a handgun from her purse and she shoots Piedra in the head from behind. Um, the vehicle, which was not particularly close to any of the entrances to Mexico, not that that really matters, but she's going to make claims about this, slid mm-hmm. to a stop and impacted a freeway barrier. Copas texted a picture to her boyfriend, and then she called 911. Now, this story, when it, it happened, because she she kills him, goes viral uh, for several reasons. Obviously, it's at the intersection of a bunch of salient issues in U.S. politics. Mm-hmm. You've got immigration. You've got the border. You've got gun control. You've got racism. But it's also a story that could kind of be briskly described as part of the now expansive Karen goes crazy genre, right? Mm-hmm. Where you've got like a woman who reacts in some sort of aggressive or violent way because, uh, you know, of, of, of shit that people would kind of could, could kind of like sum up in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, When the story broke on Twitter, before much was known about it, many of the posts that I saw just kind of casually assumed that Copas was a white suburban woman because that was the picture of the person who would do something like this that most Mm -hmm. jived with their pre-existing assumptions. Um, And kind of the, again, assumption was that she was probably a strong right-winger who had imbibed a lot of racist propaganda about the border. Mm -hmm. Um, now, as I'm going to talk about, we don't have super clear information about like what sort of info ecosystem she existed in. Um, mm-hmm. But Copas is a black woman. Um, mm-hmm. And from what I can get about her socioeconomic status, she seems to have been kind of broadly middle class. You know, she's uh, a grandmother. There was not anything. I found her social media and there was nothing in it that would make you think She was not posting about guns. She was not posting paranoid conspiracies about the border or about any of this stuff. Like it was like a weirdly normal thing, like, Mm -hmm. like social media profile. How old is she? 48. Okay. So, you know, someone who, who had a kid and young and became a grandma Mm -hmm. pretty young, but you know, there was nothing in it that like set off. I I do this all the time, right? Like I used to Mm -hmm. for a living when, you know, mass shootings and stuff would be done scrape shit on the people who had committed the shooting to talk, like Mm -hmm. try to figure out like 
what had been going on with him prior to making that decision. And Copas, I don't, there's nothing that's I would consider a warning sign in her publicly mm. available information. The mm. most recently updated post on her Facebook before killing Piedras was a profile pic from February 17th. And in general, most of the activity on her Facebook was just like occasionally updating her portrait. Um, what updates she did post were all super normal. Uh, there's an update from March of 2022 that's just a video of her dancing with her grandkid with the text, Tatum's birthday dance. He loves dancing with his Gigi. Love him. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those, because I got to this, I don't know, maybe a day or two after the shooting, the comments on there are, it's this weird thing that you get with the internet where like somebody does something terrible and then people find their anodyne social media posts and start mm -hmm. like commenting on it. So the first couple of comments on this year old post are like, Family member being like, oh, it's so cute. You know, you and the kid are so cute. And then it becomes like a bunch of weirdos posting like your family member is a murderer. Like, fuck this lady. She killed somebody, mm -hmm. uh, which is like, yeah, I mean, she did kill somebody. And I, I broadly agree. Yeah, fuck her. Because that's bad. You shouldn't shoot people in the back of the head. It's so um, true. You're always but, saying that. I'm always saying that. But it's, uh, I do, I can't not find it kind of unsettling to like hop on these pictures of a lady and her grandkid and just be like, fuck you for killing a guy. And it's like, I, it, not just fuck you for killing a guy, but like, hey, person who is a family member of this person, mm -hmm. like your your relative is, is a bad person. That's a, a strange impulse, I guess. I feel like is it's weird. It's strange um, to have that technology available to us um, uh, and all of all of the things that lets us do. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's weird. Um, kind of like right below that first post, your your kin is a murderer post is another comment from somebody who told one of Copas's relatives, visit her in prison while she is alive. LOL. El Paso, another type of jail. She will get it. LOL. Which I, I, I think they meant like El Paso has another type. It's a reference mm -hmm. to like the death penalty, right? That like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is true. But like also, I don't know, man, like, again, what she did is bad. I, I like you shouldn't be able to do that and just like walk away from it, obviously. But like, mm -hmm. it's weird to just be like, hey, family members of this person who murdered a guy like your your relative might get the chair. Like, that's such a strange yes. thing. And, it's, um, and the ease of being able to do that without leaving your house is yeah. uh, very dangerous. Yeah. And it's, th there was another, uh, someone else posted like, hey, you know, commenting, like had scraped her, her details enough to figure out that she was like a, ha a home designer for a living and mm -hmm. like noted gleefully, she'll have to decorate her new cell home cell with scrap, oh maybe using toilet paper. Um, the and then it, prison <laughs> fantasies are just never sit right, right? No matter what somebody did, it's just like, okay, calm down. Because like yeah. using prison as a way of fantasizing about revenge reveals the whole thing being what it is. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating because this person starts by being like, ha ha ha, she was a home designer and now she'll be de designing a cell. And then in the middle of the post is like, oh, I take it back. She was a caseworker, <laughs> which is, I feel like, Someone other than me, you could like, there's so much to say about America and just sort of analyzing the decision this person made to like mm -hmm. real time fact check while she was making her post without like editing or changing it. To, yeah. Like, there's so much <laughs> there. I don't know what to say about it, but it's like, I feel it's like Finnegan's Wake. We're like somewhere trapped in that post is like the secret to the madness of the United States. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but oh, yeah. we just need someone to write a dissertation on it. Yeah. G kids in college who are listening to this podcast, there you go. Like that's that's a free <laughs> one for you. Um <laughs> and it is like we're talking about how like kind of weird this is, but at the same time it's not weird, right? This is just mm -hmm. like you like anyone who's not unfamiliar with the internet knows like well, yeah, if there's like public facing social media for somebody who does something terrible, this is going to happen to it, right? That's right. just the way the world works. Um so, you know, it's 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 weird, but it's not weird. Uh, as far as Copus goes, the closest we get to anything that reveals like what kind of ideology might have made her shoot a stranger in the back of the head while he was driving her down the highway um, is a, a lecture, a quote or, or a clip from a lecture that she posted on her Facebook. And the lecture is by a guy named T.D. Jakes, who's an American non-denominational megachurch preacher. And it's like a kind of very 
patriarchal traditional little like mm. thing. He's talking about how like a woman is like salt. You know, she makes everything better, including like <laughs> she makes men who are like shitty better. And that's like the job of a woman. Mm. Right. It's of like, course. yeah, it's obviously it's like, like it's toxic, but it's not also this isn't like a like T.D. Jakes ain't Jordan Peterson. Right. This is right. a guy you, you walk into any maybe you've never heard of him but you walk in any fucking bookstore in the United States and there's T.D. Jakes books and shit. Like hmm. he is an incredibly okay. popular pre- mega church preacher. Um, so I wouldn't, there's nothing in here that I would call like a warning sign. The most actual like re like kind of thing that we get that might suggest some toxicity in her, in her personal life comes from the, uh, the fundraiser that her family posted on give, send go after she hmm. got arrested. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it reads, or it starts, our daughter, who is an attractive 48-year-old African-American woman, is being detained what? in El Paso, Texas, at the El Paso County Detention Center because of the charge of her shooting a Hispanic male. Now, that's a little weird, right? Who you wrote said, that? I, I heard her, that, right? Her family, right. You yeah, said, yeah, yeah. our daughter, who is an attractive... Who is an attractive... Or, okay. That's, that's weird. That's a little yeah. odd. They had Ann like, Rule write that sentence for them. <laughs> she came back from the grave to do it. <laughs> yeah. It was expensive. God, that's straight. It, it, that, that's, a, that's a bit peculiar, right? Now, yes. the, the post goes on to claim, and there's no evidence for this, that she asked the driver to stop numerous times and he refused to stop. And then he engaged the child locks, which is why she decided to shoot him. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, again, peculiar that, like, they des- they describe her as attractive. Um, what we can say safely, giving, given the known facts of the case, is that Phoebe Copas was a pretty normal-seeming person from the outside, who probably, I mean, it, it's probably accurate to say, had a distinctly irrational fear of being kidnapped. And that fear mm. was exacerbated by her proximity to Mexico. Mm. Copas has spoken out since her arrest through her lawyer to claim that she demanded Piedras pull over and let her out and that he told her he was taking her to a fair in Juarez. Again, there's zero evidence of this. And the mm-hmm. police report states, the defendant never called for police or emergency services to report her being in any immediate danger prior to shooting the complaining witness. The defendant took a photo of the complaining witness after he was shot and sent it to her boyfriend via text message prior to calling 911. Um, Copas's lawyer, Matthew Kozak, has claimed that the like media that Copas had been ingesting had mm. contributed to the mindset that she was in when she carried out the shooting. Uh, From Yahoo News, quote, he said that his client was in fear of her life because of her knowledge of violence and kidnappings in Juarez and seeing highway signs on U.S. 54 showing exits to Juarez. During the hearing, Kozik showed news articles reporting on violence in Juarez, including stories about drug cartels and kidnappings. He also showed photos where the shooting happened and traffic signs showing the highway led to Juarez. So, like, that's what her defense is going to rest on. And I, I, I think there's a degree to which... Like, I don't think that's a good defense, but it's Mm -hmm. it is accurate that if you are uh, like somebody who engage like who consumes mainstream news media, most of what you hear about Juarez is kidnappings and murders. Right. Mm -hmm. Most of what you hear about the U.S. border is kidnappings and murders. Now, I I can remember like fucking 15 years ago, I was on a road trip and we like were in El Paso and crossed over to Juarez to get lunch. And when we came back, the Border Patrol guy was so suspicious of us that he like stripped our car down, like took every, wow. like, like almost to like the fucking metal. Um, mm-hmm. Because he was like, nobody stops in Juarez for lunch. It's the most dangerous city on earth. And it's like, man, like, yeah, if you're fucking doing weirdo, like if you're doing certain things, it's dangerous. But like, it's also a place just a lot of people live. You can go get lunch in Juarez. The cartels aren't coming for you there. You know, like, but it is like, that's just how people think about the city. Um which is peculiar mm-hmm. to me, but I, I, yeah. I, I yeah, I, I started kind of looking into the media surrounded kidnap surrounding kidnappings in the United States because mm-hmm. it 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 was one of those things. I felt like there had to be something peculiar there that like would set someone like Phoebe Copas off. Like there had to be, even if we don't have you know kind of evidence from her info diet. I st- when I started like looking into just kind of going on the big, the major social media apps, looking up like what kind of the trending stories involving kidnapping or human trafficking was, you start to like see some patterns. And one of the patterns is that mm. kidnapping related content is among the most reliable ways to go viral mm. on the internet mm. right now. 
Um, if you start looking for kid TikToks using kidnapping, using human trafficking, you'll see a bunch that have multiple million views. And if particularly one of the things that keyed me in is like, I would see some weirdo who would do something like take a clip from a, a made for TV movie about a kid getting kidnapped and mm-hmm. then like put an AI voiceover over it to be talking about like, here's, yeah. you know, how kidnappings happen. And that yeah, video would have like too. 4 million views and everything else in their channel would be like 10, 20,000, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, this is like a reliable way to get follows and to get views is like putting kidnapping shit out there. I love the AI voice that they use in like movie summary accounts and also stuff like that where it's like yeah. the girl is walking down the street. The, the man girl. grabs her by the wrist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've seen exactly the ones I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so I started looking into this and it, it kept getting weirder and weirder. So one mm. TikTok that I found in my research was from the account TV Moments, which has 244,000 <laughs> followers and 14.3 million likes. Um, it, and it, it mostly posts clips from news stories with on-screen text summaries, stuff like triple homicide suspect in cl- appears in court with the text heartbreaking story in red above it, or titles oh like God. child abducted from Berkeley home, American kidnapped walking dog in Mexico. And this video that I'm about to show, or Sophie's about to show you, which was posted April 2nd, uses a clip from News Nation, which is a, an, a, a news network that is kind of like a mild conservative bent. Um, and here's, here's how mm-hmm. it sounds. A $40,000 reward is being offered to help find an American woman who went missing in Mexico. This new reward comes four months after that she was snatched into a van in broad daylight. And now her family in California is calling for authorities to finally bring her home. News Nation correspondent Jorge Ventura joining us live in El Paso tonight. Jorge, we're learning that this was a targeted attack. Yeah, that's right, Natasha. We have new images of an American woman, Monica de Leon Barbara, showing her alleged kidnapping in Mexico in November of last year. The FBI says she was walking her dog from the gym and that this kidnapping is most likely targeted. She was actually walking uh, in the Jalisco state in Mexico. The FBI is asking for the public's help in finding and they're offering up to $40,000 for information leading up to her recovery. Now, FBI investigators believe that her attack uh, was targeted and we're still waiting for more information now, on that. Right. So you listen to that and it's clear this is, again, it's like a targeted abduction but the the actual like media like everything that's like Mm -hmm. written in text on the clip everything in in the titling of the clip is just an american was kidnapped in mexico the actual story here is like yeah this this person was kidnapped specifically because of who she was this was not random they Mm -hmm. weren't just like looking for a lady like they were looking for this woman because of Mm -hmm. like a family connection right like Mm -hmm. which is the thing that happens and that's how most very, very rarely are people abducted at random anywhere in the mm-hmm. world. It's not a super common kind of crime. Um, but this this would have been, I think, kind of one of the most recent stories that Copas might have encountered relating to mm. El Paso. It was kind of mm-hmm. a big deal. And it mm. sets off up this kind of idea that like Americans are getting randomly picked up off the street, right at the border. Um, obviously, the reality is that El Paso in particular is one of the safest cities in the United States. Um, it's the fourth safest large city in the U.S. It has extremely r- low rates of violence and property crime. Um, but that's not what people think when they hear about it because of the reliability of uh, like content that involves kidnapping in the border going viral. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every aspect of this story is tied in with the fact that for more than a century, the United States has been engaged in a kind of perpetual moral panic over our border with Mexico. <laughs> Um, And it's one of those things that like this is, you know, uh, people have been kind of like broadly positive about some of the 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 ways that the the right has performed poorly at the ballot box in the last couple of elections. Mm. Um, But one area in which their prop like conservative propaganda in particular has been undoubtedly successful is at creating a sense of fear in behalf of the majority of this country about the border. Um, an NPR poll from last year showed that more than half of Americans perceived that there was an invasion going on at the southern border. Um, support for immigrants has broadly declined over the last four to six years. Um, and it's, it's you know, I, I, again, all of this is kind of playing it. It's kind of cooking into the stew of whatever was going on in this woman's head when she decided to shoot that guy. The fact that Texas recently made permitless concealed carry legal also certainly played a role. Um 
And there's something else that I suspect might have contributed, which is that for the last eight years or so, false stories have been spreading with increasing regularity about random people being targeted by kidnappers or robbers. These primarily spread today on TikTok and Facebook. That's where most of the stuff comes from. Um, but also this kind of brand of content has been going on and been spreading in this country since well before the birth of the internet. Um, you might remember, Sarah, because you you and I are both olds, like the uh, <laughs> stories about like hook-handed killers in the backseat of cars, right? Like, do you hear, did you hear that as a kid? You ever hear that like, like, yeah, those tales about yeah, like people I, waiting in the seats of cars. Yeah, I encountered it, I think. Yeah, because there's like, I think I more encountered it secondhand through other forms of media. But like, yes, there's definitely a lot of hook-handed men to go around. I know there's a, a great hook-hand story in um, Adventures in Babysitting. Yes, that, to set yes. Up, is it Handsome John Pruitt? <laughs> yeah, great film also. Um, and it's it's one of those things like, I can remember, I'm sure that like, particularly just because of aspects of our culture, young women get like more of these kind of warning stories. You should always be aware. Mm -hmm. People might be there to abduct you. But like when I did my driving, when I went to like driving school to like get my, my, my license, uh, one of the things they taught us was that anytime you're going back to your car, you should check underneath it to see if someone's oh there. Like that's, that was just like a thing in driving school. That, like there might be people waiting under your car to attack it's like, you. How many confirmed cases do we have of this that aren't Cape fear? I, I have not come across a single one. So yeah, it's, it's just Cape fear. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's just the result of a uh, fucking, um, Oh God. Now I've forgotten his, you know, the, the, the Cape fear guy. Oh yeah. Max. It's Katie. Stephen, Stephen King. Yeah. Well, I was going to say Stephen King. It's just like Stephen King funding all of the driving schools in this country. Like, no, you yeah, have to warn yeah, people. The, the Miko Hughes, uh, uh, G, yeah. uh, the Miko Hughes Drivers Exam Pavilion. Yeah, and there's also <laughs> that. Also, I mean, there's so many of these. But one I remember making the rounds when I was in high school was like, women should not wear <laughs> overalls or long ponytails or braids because if you have a long pony, Sophie, you're fucked by the way. And so yeah, I. I have a long ponytail and yeah. you have a long braid. That's why I shaved um, my head. Stop me from, exactly. I'm not going to get kidnapped now. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh -huh. of the kidnappers, uh -huh. they, it's like when you go to the pumpkin patch to get a pumpkin, they want a handle. Yeah. And it's like, if you don't give them a braid to grab onto, you'll be safe. That's and it's like, I'm fucked. Who, who, uh, <laughs> that's the only, and also it's like, what a that's weird my only hairstyle, Sarah. I'm so screwed. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> you've made it this far. I honestly, <laughs> well, for, for more than just that reason, but yes, <laughs> it's very, it's very funny. Cause like, again, I think probably the majority of times when people get advice like this, it is like women being warned about the dangers of the world. I have also, especially when my beard was longer, I would just like, you know, I'm going to like a, I'm at like a gun range or something. And some guy's like, you know, if you don't shave that, you know, in a fight, somebody will like pull that to control you. Then get control. And I'm oh. like, man, how many fights are you getting in? Like, how, <laughs> how often are you get are you scrapping with dudes? Like really? that is like I, I, I've been in more fights than most people just because like I'm a a public person who gets assaulted on the street sometimes. And I don't get in enough fights to be concerned about my beard getting pulled. Like that's not a, you can't you, let you, it control you, your like, beard length. Then the fascists win. Yeah. Then the, then the fucking Nazis have won. <laughs> <laughs> it's so like the, the, this kind the of like of the beard. <laughs> it's this it's this interesting mix of like true crime brain and tactical brain that have like created <laughs> something. And again, I think this is rel you know relating to the murder that Cope has carried out. But mm -hmm. like these two things cooking together to this, like you have to always be on like be ready for danger, yes. and also being ready for danger means being perpetually armed and prepared to do violence. Um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's when, good I stuff. when I was a kid, there was this story that went around at a uh, different middle school than mine that somebody had been kidnapped but and it was really scary but they were okay that was a lie that didn't happen but everybody but wasn't it exciting but everybody yeah. knew about it and then like and then like an, an, into early adulthood I, I brought it up to somebody and they were like that was literally just them trying to scare the shit out of everybody to not talk to strangers it's like yeah cool wow well, that, yeah, what a great information! What a great misinformation campaign! Love that yeah. for us. It, it it is great, Sarah. 
<laughs> and we're going to talk more about kind of the prehistory of America's paranoia of getting kidnapped, Americans' paranoia over getting kidnapped by strangers. But when it comes to the modern kind of kidnapping panic that I think played into this murder that that is mm-hmm. sort of sweep it continuing to sweep through social media right now. I can trace the origins of it back to 2015, which is it when rumors started spreading on social media, namely Facebook, that car thieves had cooked up a new tactic for like a getting people right uh, text from one relevant story reads car thieves are always trying to find new schemes for getting into your car to steal your valuables you may have heard reports of tech devices used to enter your car but some thieves are using a less intricate method there have been a rash of robberies using of all things a penny or a nickel how are they oh using a God. coin to enter your car whether your car basically the idea is that like if you see a, th- a penny or a nickel in like slid into the door handle of your car it's like mm-hmm. evidence that a car thief is trying to like break in right um and there's people are so bored aren't they they're bored and they're dumb as fuck sarah like (laughs) (laughs) it's so fucking again i'm a very paranoid person because people like have attacked me and threatened Mm -hmm. to murder me right like so like i have a grenade launcher sitting next that's not part of the paranoia that was just that's just a recreational grenade launcher but like right and i don't like obsess over this kind of shit (laughs) (laughs) it's because it's stupid because like that's it it, the the initial Mm -hmm. version of this is that like thieves were you know if if there was a coin in the door of your car it meant that a thief was trying to disable your remote locking systems this does not really work right like you can't actually disable a car's remote locking system like Mm -hmm. realistically this way yeah yeah there were a couple of cars a while ago that had like a specific sort of problem that allowed something similar to this to work but it was Mm -hmm. never like a widespread thing Mm -hmm. um and because it like i don't know because that was such a silly thing the 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 theory i don't know conspiracy theory isn't what i don't know what to call these things but so you it starts off with like this is evidence that someone has tried to get into your car and then it evolves to instead of they're using sticking pennies or whatever in your car to disable the locks, it's a way to mark which vehicles have goodies so that they can steal from them later. And like, why not just do it now? Why not just break in now? (laughs) Again, I had my car broken into not all that long ago back in, I mean, this was in San Francisco, but like a bunch of shit jacked from it. Cause that's, and say if you park with anything in a car in San Francisco and walk away, your car will be broken into and within seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also like nobody's like marking your car for later. They see shit, they break a window, they grab it, right? Like that's the way the No, <laughs> everyone the, has a master plan. Everyone is Moriarty yeah. out there. Yeah, there's like fucking rings of people marking and it's also like if you actually think logically about it, well, well then are they marking it and like following it home to get your fucking purse? Like right? what They're why? Out you that's to be shopping all day. <laughs> mhm. None of it makes any sense. And Snopes looked into all of these kind of very, because there's a number of variations and they found no evidence that like this was at, like people sticking pennies into car doors was a factor in any sort of crime. They talked to like service departments at dealerships who were like, mm. yeah, locks don't work that way. They talked to police departments who were like, we've never heard, you know, of any sort of tactics like this being spread mm. among car burglars. Um, and in an article at the time, they tied this myth back to certain myths that had spread back in like the 80s and 90s through mm. what were then called chain letters. Mm. Sarah, again, I, I apologize, but like you and I are both uh, uh, ancient, you know. We're uh, a certain age. We make terrifying yeah. sounds when we get mm-hmm. up from squatting. That's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we're a thousand years <laughs> old. We have seen yeah. the birth of time itself. It and so great. we remember chain letters. <laughs> Yeah. Like our Gen Z listeners are like, what the fuck is a chain letter? Um, yeah. And it's funny because, again, I don't remember receiving chain letters, but I remember them being something with a, like that everyone made jokes about and that there was yeah. a kind of cultural literacy around in the 90s. Yes. I was, you know, even for, for like, because uh, I, I, I was mostly the same way where it was a thing that like my mom and her sisters and stuff, they would talk about, my older cousins would talk about. I remember one specific time we got a chain letter and it was like shown to me because they were starting to get rarer in the early 90s. Mm. It was shown to me as like a, mm. look at this, isn't this funny? Look at this weird thing that we got. Mm. Um, and we're going to talk about what chain letters were, because really what we're seeing when we look at a chain letter is the birth of meme culture. Um, yeah. it, it goes back surprisingly far, but it all relates very directly to the shit spreading on TikTok and Facebook. But you know what else relates to misinformation spreading on the internet? Oh, 
I advertising do. because advertising <laughs> is what makes disinformation profitable. Mm-hmm. So Sarah, Sophie, Robert. here's some ads. Oh, great. We're back and we're about to start talking about chain letters. So chain letters, as I've, I've talked about, like there's the, I, I didn't really I never really thought about this before I started researching this. But the more I got into it, the more I realized like, oh, like everything that's hap- that ha- happens today that's happened for the last 20 years on the Internet in terms of like what we call meme culture was sort of preceded by chain letters. Um, and in fact, an interesting aspect like the chain letters are like. It, they are letters that uh, would at a, back in the day would arrive in your mailbox and it, it, they were a mix of like forward this to you know the next ten, 10 people that you know in order to not get bad luck sometimes they were like here's a story about like a bad thing that's happened or like here's a you know a thing to be worried about and, you know forward this t- so that your friends know about this danger about these cri- you know th- about this thing that murderers do or whatever. Like there's a variety of different kind of like chain letters over the years. One of the things I didn't realize until I got into this is that um, geneticists, like scientists and researchers teaching genetics use chain letters in their, um, because you can apply some of the same algorithms that you apply to like calculating mutations in genetics to oh my the God. way chain letters alter over time That's there's fantastic. a there's a, a surprising amount of stuff about it like it's a really <laughs> good way to talk about because over time both like people would alter chain letters in order to like make them more relevant but also hmm. just mutations would occur because like a lot mm-hmm. of chain letters were initially handwritten and then they'd get mimeographed and then after a time it would get so messy that you'd type up a fresh version and you'd introduce changes so like mm-hmm. it was actually like it is a pretty good way going over like, oh, here's 80 years worth of like related chain letters and we can sort of track the alterations over time in the same way that we look at the way that mutations get introduced into into a, a genetic sequence. I, I didn't realize mm. that. It's not really relevant to the story, but it's kind of cool. But it's so great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad to know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like a surprising amount of like scientific studies on how durable it actually is to use chain letters for this purpose. (laughs) Yeah. Cool stuff. So I I found a contemporary casual history of chain letters on slate. um, Hmm. And there's a couple of other places that have done similar sort of, again, casual histories, and they generally tie the birth of the chain letter back to Europe, generally England uh, and the United States starting in the 1700s, right? Kind of when we, when we both have the origins of a relevant, like or of a reasonably reliable postal service, you know, which kind of starts to happen in the late 1700s. And when we have a printing press so that people like obviously, right, you can both print letters uh, and and copy them sort of semi reliably and you can Mm -hmm. send them places. Um, That said, again, this is what you get in the casual histories. When you really dig into it and you find the the chain letter like uh, uh, like the chain letter nerds, I guess you'd mm-hmm. call them, the obsessives, they kind of bristle at starting it in the 1700s. Their argument is that it goes back much, much further. Um, <laughs> and this is where things go off the rails a little bit. The most detailed analysis of the history of this art form that I have found comes from an independent researcher named Daniel W. Van Arsdale. Starting in the 1990s, he started collecting huge numbers of chain letters and posting them on his private website, which is a thing people don't really have anymore. Um, his website God. is down, but it's still you can find it on the Wayback Machine, and it's very much like a late 90s, early 2000s, like, here's this maniac who is obsessed with chain letters in a degree that probably no one else in history ever was, and he wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of words. He, he read like God knows how many of these letters he like categorized them and graphed them. And anyway, he splits chain letters into he's probably the number one expert on the concept of what chain letters. What does the who's W ever stand for? No one knows. I don't oh, know. OK, <laughs> someone probably knows. Does it say- I assume this man is dead. <laughs> I think it's I think it's Daniel Wayback Machine. Ben <laughs> yeah, there's no way this guy is alive still, but I, I love him. Um, but this is what this is what social media has taken from us. Right. You used to get crazy people who would build websites dedicated to their obsession and you could learn so much from those websites. And now everybody just argues about race science on Twitter. Um, <sighs> it's, it's so much worse these today. We used to have uh, Ted the Caver, you know? Exactly, exactly. We used to have Ted the Caver. God. 
What a glorious time. So <laughs> our buddy Van Arsdale in his in his maniac website splits chain letters into several broad categories. Uh, one category is what he calls letters from heaven. These are letters that people claim were written or channeled via God or an angel or some other divine being. And like nice. generally either like, you know, this letter will protect you if you send it to X number of people. These became particularly common in Europe starting in World War One, and then again in World War Two. You mm. would send them to like, they were primarily things like you'd have families who were, their kids were overseas and they were worried about them. And they would get a letter being like, this will protect your son if you send this to X, you know, mm. number, uh, right, r- whatever. Um, oftentimes there was a kind of a scam involved where like you wouldn't just have to forward the letter. You'd send a donation to a central area and you'd forward the letter to 10 random people or whatever. And, you know, folks are superstitious. They're kind of it, when you're waiting for your to know if your son got killed at the Somme, you're kind of out of your mind a little bit, you know, like with worry. That's a yeah, normal thing. Yeah, consumer base, really. Yeah, yeah. It's a great, it's a great business to be in, is what I'm saying. Um, uh, the other major kind of chain letter is the uh, the good luck chain letter, which is kind of a more secular version of the letter from heaven, right? Where it's mm. instead of like. I'm an angel and here's how you can protect your loved one. It's more like this letter is good luck if you replicate it and you pass it on. And sometimes also if you send money to somebody, right? These are kind of broadly speaking what most chain letters, you know, for 200 years or so in the West, Mm -hmm. like kind of fell Mm -hmm. into. But Van Arsdale argues that the origin of the chain letters starts a lot older than the printing press, uh, than the postal service, and even potentially than Christianity. Um, one example that he picks out that he, th- this is what he says is like kind of the earliest example that you can find of chain letter like content is from the ancient Egyptian book of the dead. Um, Amazing. bet you weren't expecting us to go there. I never am. <laughs> yeah, but it turns out Brendan Fraser had it in his hands. He did. He did. And <laughs> like, like in Brendan Fraser's classic film, the mummy, I am now going to read from the book of the dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh boy! Well, here's what we here's had a good run. Here's a passage that Van Arsdale con- and I actually think he's probably right about this that he considers to be this is kind of exa- an example of a precursor sort of content to what you got with these chain letters. The man who shall make a picture of the things which are to the north of the hidden house of the Twat shall find it of great benefit to him both in heaven and on earth. And he who knows it shall be among the spirits near Ra. And he who recites the words of Isis and Ser shall repulse Apep and Amentet. And he shall have a place on the boat of Ra, both in heaven and upon the earth. The man who knows not this picture shall never be able to repulse the serpent, Nehra Ra. So... It's like both you have to, you know, in order to avoid being, you know, punished by these evil spirits, you have to recite these specific words and you have to share them with other people. Right. And if you don't, someone who like hasn't seen this is vulnerable to this. Right. Like you could it's that same idea. Right. Like where there's this here's this thing that you've now been informed of and you both have to be aware of it and also spread it to other people. Otherwise, you will suffer in some way, you know. It's so fun how it's like the opposite of a curse like we get in the Evil Dead where it's like, don't read the words. And this is like, read the words and read them to all your friends. Yeah, please do read them to everyone. Otherwise, you're (laughs) fucked. (laughs) Yeah, some serpent scum. I'm not an ancient Egyptian expert, but I think it's pretty obvious. Like, oh, yeah, that is there is an element of what people were getting Mm -hmm. with these like chain letters that is present in this this ancient religious text like, and it, it comment and subscribe yeah like comment and subscribe <laughs> to avoid the serpent nehra-ra. um so van arsdale likewise notes that some early buddhist sutras uh promise good luck or spiritual benefits for reproducing specific pieces of text Hmm. Um, quote and this is from van arsdale's website the world's oldest example of printing are Dharani, or magical incantations, printed in Japan between 764 and 770, during the reign of the Empress Shotoku. A total of over one million copies of four different Dharani are from the, uh, from the great Dharani Sutra of the Spotless and Pure Light, were printed to be placed in one million pagodas built at the command of Shotoku. In this sutra, it is stated that if a person will to bu- were to build several million small pagodas and place copies of Dharani in them, that person's life would be lengthened, evil karma would be expunged, and rebels or enemies would be vanquished. So, again, back in the day, you had to be emperor to, like, indulge in, in, in chain letter culture. Like, 
you know, today you can just send a bunch of letters to your friends and family, or, you know, you could in the 80s when people sent letters. But back in 770, you had to be the emperor, so you could build a million pagodas to put the message in, otherwise you're going to get killed by rebels. I would love um, to see an influencer do that today, the million yeah. pagoda challenge. <laughs> you have to, Mr. Beast <laughs> needs to make a million pagodas or he's going to get murdered. <laughs> yeah, and it, back in the, so these Darani, this is again a very early printing process, they would have been made, printed using copper plates. And it's it's likely that prior to the advent of kind of traditional printing presses, this sutra would have been among, if not the most widely produced piece of text in history. Um, <laughs> many of these small pagodas that, and this didn't just happen in Japan, there were kind of variants of this all throughout Asia where like, basically, if you're the king, you want to make a bunch of pagodas with a specific message in them in order to avoid bad luck befalling you, right? Incredible. Um, again, that's not that different from a chain letter, no. really. no. Um, it's more labor intensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's much more labor intensive, although it is other people's la- labor, right? There you <laughs> like, go. Um, I also find it interesting that like, again, a lot of like modern chain letters were stuff like, you know, if you spread this, you know, you won't get fired, you won't lose your job or you'll get a raise at work or something. Whereas with with emperors, it's like if you spread this, it is saying you, you'll lose your you won't lose your job, but it's like rebels won't overthrow you and murder you. <laughs> Yeah. The stakes have decreased a little bit. The lately. stakes have decreased slightly. I was not slightly. expecting that. <laughs> yeah. The commonality here, though, is that it's it's kind of relying on the paranoia and fear of a comfortable person generally that they will become mm. less comfortable. You know, That's if so like they don't follow these instructions. Um, yeah. And there's a degree of like follow like this is a everyone's always especially like and this is a thing that like you know we can talk about what wealth does and doesn't do. But the, the, the way in which the super rich act and the paranoia that is kind of ever present mm-hmm. in their lives is proof that like when you're one of the people who like gets God's hits, God's great roulette w- wheel and winds up with millions and millions of dollars, you're still always worried that something is going to take it from you. Mm-hmm. Um, and j- likewise, just everyone feels that way, right? Like if your precarity is, is a, is a, an inherent aspect of, of humanity, right? Fe- mm-hmm. Even if you're not in a precarious situation, just the fear that like, you know, my kid could die overseas in the war or I could get cancer or whatever. Life yeah. is random and that's scary. And all of these things, the kind of commonality between all of these things and chain letters is like, it offers you sort of a, a feeling of protection from the inherent randomness of life. Um, right. Yeah. The first recognizable chain letters started to spread from the 1500s on <laughs> across Europe. It actually does go back further than the casual Amazing. slate histories of chain letters seem to say. And there were basically Ponzi schemes, right? Like mm-hmm. you would be asked to pay money to whoever's name was on top of the list in order to avoid bad luck. And then you would like erase the name on the letter usually the handwritten letter that you'd received and then like add your own name to the list and send it on to other people. And like, you know, honestly, that's how cryptocurrency pretty much works, right? <laughs> like it's, this is, this is again, these are not like we, we keep inventing fancier ways to do the same thing over right. and over again. Well, yeah. To be fair, when you reskin an old scam, people really get into it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it always works. Um, anyway, uh, uh, you know what else is an, a long and successful scam. Capitalism? Ad, well, yeah, advertising, <laughs> capitalism, whatever. Um, here you go. Man, I hope it's a Reagan coin ad. I So do I. <laughs> oh, we are back. Ah, uh, good times. Sarah, do you have any Great crypto? Oldies. You a big crypto fan? I have zero crypto. My deal with new ideas is to wait them out for 20 years. Yeah. Until the storm has passed. And that really serves me well. Yeah. I, I took kind of a, a, a mixed version of it where I, I didn't get any cryptocurrency, but I do have a full back tattoo of the Bitcoin logo. <laughs> I have a back tattoo of a bored ape. So, you know, oh, yeah, you, 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 you have famously been been in on the ground floor of the board ape yacht club. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're doing well these days. <laughs> I will tell you, though, speaking of new scams mm-hmm. and I have not really confessed this before. Um, I did back in the goop days. 
fall of 2016, we're all a little nuts. I bought a jade egg and I used it and wow. I liked it. And then I read about how because they have a hole drilled in them um, and are porous, uh, they can give you, you know, horrible bacterial infections or whatever. Oh, and well, then I stopped using it. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is why, you know. I have some friends who are into sounding, which is a a thing if you have a penis where you like put a long and rigid rod into your penis. Uh, But they all use like titanium rods and stuff, right? Or glass, you know, stuff that's that's non-porous, which does make sense. What is that meant to do, though? Look, I'm not into sounding personally. It's a thing you like. People can look that up at home for themselves, but it it apparently feels good. Take an afternoon. Oh, okay. I would not guess that that felt good, but what do I know? I was really thinking when you said that word that you like lay your penis on a drum that someone is is playing but that that's what that's more what i would do if i that i mean that that you're you're taking the sound part very literally huh that's interesting (laughs) it's fascinating actually um anyway so just like crypto evangelists have to had to pretend that they were building a new global currency system that was like more equitable you know and that they were Mm -hmm. trying to take power from warmongering governments or whatever early scam chain letter operators had to dress up schemes that were fundamentally about taking advantage of greed as selfless acts of charity and here's a quote from uh, van arsdale's website an 1888 letter solicits dimes for the educations of the poor whites in the region of the cumberlands this letter (laughs) states it as an adapt adaptation of a previous solicitation and asks that four copies be sent to friends for compliance you will receive the blessing of him who was ready to die for us this is the earliest known chain letter an 1889 example at an american uh, an american college student solicited dimes and 10 copies this letter claims to be self-terminating recipients were asked to increment a generation count at the top of the letter until it reached some preset maximum at which time the chain was to stop this practice continued at least through 1916, but a few years after a chain letter was launched, only those circulated which had the inflated maximum. We have two examples of a solicitation for used postage stamps to build a children's ward in Australia. The first is from 1900 and is number 173 of 180 maximum. The second, highly modified, was still in circulation 10 years later and is number 375 of 480 maximum. Right, so you see what people are doing where they're saying like, this isn't a scam. You know, we're, 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 we'll terminate this at a certain mm-hmm. point when the money has been raised. And there was this understanding that if you made it feel like you were closer to the end of, mm-hmm. of of the chain letters circulation that that would get more people to respond. So everyone would just lie and like pretend like you were, you know, it doesn't matter if you're 173 of 180 or 375 of 480, but that's just the way they decided human beings work, right? I mean, NPR does that in the pledge drive and it seems to work sure. for them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, <laughs> all of these are examples of like, er, yeah. like long stay, like just this is just how humans be, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I bought the grenade technology. launcher in my room because I was worried they were going to run out of these grenade launchers. You know, it's an old police one. Um, uh, you can see them in riot get videos it at a from the 70s. Prospect police auction. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it's funny. This is unrelated, but because a grenade launcher is not legally a firearm or any other kind of weapon, they just FedEx them right to your door. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like it's like buying a wig or whatever right like it's completely uncontrolled you um, gotta get the grenade launcher account for these ads i mean yeah no, uh, what could be more convenient i would very happily sell grenade launchers on this show nobody commits crimes with grenade launchers you know they're they're purely it's not really tools an impulsive of the state. weapon to use it would seem no, right no, you can't no. take one with you into an uber that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this is this is this is my free ad for grenade launchers. <laughs> Early chain letters were made by people who often legitimately wanted to spread a religious message. Uh, other examples of the art form seem to have been local kind of citizen journalism, almost right in an era where newspapers weren't super common. People being like, "Hey, here's this problem. You know, like we have poor mm. poor whites in the Cumberlands. Let's raise money for them or whatever." Oh my um, goodness. But once the Telegram and Reliable Postal Service started to Mm. enable the mass transmission of these letters for the first time, things very quickly got out of hand and they became purely vehicles of like separating folks from their money. Um, Mm -hmm. And this happened in the U.S. and Britain before basically anywhere else. In London, a popular kind of chain letter was called the Peripatetic Contribution Box. 
Uh, and it was a mix of all these kinds of impulses. The basic idea was that each person who received the letter would send a dime to the originator and make three copies of the letter asking friends to do the same thing. One of these letters was sent by the Bishop of Bedford in 1888 <laughs> to raise money for a destitute women's home during the Jack the Ripper slayings. And oh. so it it's this kind of thing where like, Women are being murdered. There's this, this is the first famous crime spree, right? This is the first mass media crime spree, right? The first crime mm-hmm. spree that like newspapers and, and like the early news media have like adopted and are covering. And so he's, he's like hitching in order to try to raise money for a women's shelter. He's basically hitching onto the fame of the Jack the Ripper slayings and help making like you can contribute positively to solving like stopping these murders if you if you donate money and it works like this is the first example of that i've ever found wow. of that kind of tactic working mm-hmm. it went so viral that the bishop was receiving 16,000 letters a week like he couldn't deal with the mass of like oh that's a God. lot today right like if you're getting yes. if you yeah like mr beast couldn't pull that off you know <laughs> Bishop Beast. Yeah, Bishop Beast. He And it's like, from what I, I, I haven't found any evidence that this guy was a scammer. He was just like, oh, people are concerned about poor women mm-hmm. in London because of these murders. I will use that concern to try to like fund a women's shelter. And it just mm-hmm. worked. And because it works so well, scammers see opportunity. Mm-hmm. They're like, wait a second, all these people are sending dimes to this bishop ass motherfucker because let's like raise money for this. What if we send copycat letters claiming to be the bishop, but with a different address. Perhaps we can get some of those sweet, sweet dimes. And so like an unknown number of people make money off of this, but also just as an accident, other bishops with in towns that have similar names start receiving coins because like <laughs> people are dumb, right? Like, um, yeah, wild You're supposed shit. supposed to go to the Artful Dodger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite, quite fun. Um, across the pond, American con men and fundraisers alike also paid attention to what was happening. They like see this go down in London and are like, well, shit, this seems like we can make a lot of money. <laughs> um, here's uh, a quote from uh, an article, that article that uh, in Slate that I was uh, talking about earlier. During the 1890s, chain letter fundraising pl- proliferated for everything from a bike path in Michigan to a consumptive railroad telegrapher. By July ni- 1898, the New York world was pre-printing chain letter forms to fundraise for a memorial for Spanish-American war soldiers. Do not break the chain, which will result in honoring the memory of the men who sacrificed their lives, it chided. Oh Upon Lord. seeing what the world's proprietor had wrought, his rivals at the New York son were blunt in their assessment. Pulitzer is insane. (laughs) Yeah, they had good reason to scoff. Earlier that year, a 17-year-old Red Cross volunteer in Long Island, Natalie Schenk, had contrived a chain to provide ice for troops in Cuba, causing 3,500 letters at a time to pour into the tiny post office of Babylon, New York. We did not consider what patriotic Americans are capable of, the girl's mother fretted to the press. (laughs) Yeah, this is like a common thing with chain letters, like people starting them, especially in the era where they weren't always con men. Some people would like start Mm -hmm. them to try to raise money for causes. It's always this like, well, now suddenly we have created like a massive logistical problem for our town yeah. and the postal service and don't know what to do. No one, it, this is like n- 19 and dot, right? Nobody can handle 3,500 letters. Like, it was like a Buster y- Keaton movie too. Like the poor yeah. mail clerk trying to keep mm-hmm. up. Yeah, we, we, have di- we have destroyed our town's ability to be connected to the world because of this. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, chain letters made a huge comeback in World War I, uh, both because of superstitious families who would do kind of anything in order to feel like mm-hmm. they were protecting their kid, and for stranger reasons. Pro-German Americans used chain letters to raise money for the war effort, uh, and this was eventually the New York Times attacked this as a plot to clog the U.S. mail. Sometimes you'll <laughs> see people report that, like, there was a German scheme to clog the mail. For what I've come across, I'm not sure if there was actually a plot, or it's just that, like, any time one of these went viral, it caused a logistical problem. It was like a bomb right. going off in the post office. <laughs> um, by 1899, this had all become enough of a problem that the U.S. Postal Service had declared dime chain letters a violation of lottery laws. And they started oh. regulating shit, right? Where they're like, this is this is a lottery. Like, you're running an illegal lottery and you have to stop. We can't handle this. But what of the soldiers and their ice? <laughs> but what of the soldiers and their ice? The, the boys in Cuba. <laughs> um look if you want to support our 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 brave troops in Cuba running that torture prison um 
send a fifty dollars to to me and Sophie. Sophie, what's 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 our home address? Do we have a PO box yet for people to send us money for the boys in Cuba? Uh it's uh one eight one eight five two. Uh, we're never telling you. Oh well, okay. <laughs> I guess Ron DeSantis won't get his ice as he as he as he does a war crime. As he does a war crime. <laughs> it's tragic. So. 1899, the Postal Service is like, this shit has to stop. Like, we cannot handle all of the fucking dime cons you people are running. And so con artists got around this by sending letters by hand, like dropping letters in mailboxes and saying, don't send this through the Postal Service. It won't work. Mm. The magic, you won't get the good luck. You need to send the (laughs) dime and like drop it off at this location. And this actually worked better than you'd think. One chain letter factory, because this obviously like, as with as with breaking into cars and shit became the mm-hmm. the purview of organized crime, right? Because mm. it's much more efficient in the capitalist sense if you like have an organization that's putting out chain letters and reaping money. One yeah. chain letter factory in Toledo, Ohio had 125 full-time employees making these things when it was shut down by the feds. <laughs> um by the mail cops. Terrible now, job. Being a mail cop? Or well, being that a chain and letter also writer. being a chain letter yeah. writer. I mean, were they writing them by <laughs> hand? Did they have little typewriters? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was type. It would. I mean, yeah, well, wow. I think it would have been type. Although I think some of them they did do by hand, just because like that was the the thing that worked best. You know, mm-hmm. might have been. Now, as I've gone over this history, you've probably noticed that the history of chain letters. This isn't totally. This seems pretty familiar as people who have like grown up on the internet, right? Like there's mm-hmm. there's all of this these these things are spreading in a kind of a similar way to how disinformation and shit and cons spread on the internet, right? You start with questionably okay. accurate stories of disasters and tragedies around the world, mm. then you move to a call to action, either to like try to get money for something or to spread various beliefs about the world. Um, and then you, you kind of the way in which you tend to get people to spread stuff and get people interested is to share often false stories of horrific violence or stuff mm. like kidnapping, right? Um, shit that people are, are inherently drawn to. And as a result of this kind of the earliest sort of chain letter meme that is kind of directly in the, in the chain of evolution to the stuff that we've been started this episode talking about are chain letters that would warn recipients about knife wielding murderers hiding in the back seats of cars to murder and abduct okay. women. These started to spread in the eighties and nineties. Oh. And once, once email became a thing, one of the first things that would spread through email were, were copies of this specific chain letter. And I'm going to read one early <laughs> modern example of this letter. A friend stopped at the pay at the pump gas station to get gas. Once she filled her gas tank and after paying at the pump and starting to leave, the voice of the attendant inside came over the speaker. He told her that something had happened with her card and that she needed to come inside to pay. The lady was confused because the transaction showed complete and approved. She relayed that to him and was getting ready to leave, but the attendant once again urged her to come in to pay or there'd be trouble. She proceeded to go inside and started arguing with the attendant about his threat. He told her to calm down and listen carefully. He said that while she was pumping gas, a guy slipped into the backseat of her car on the other side, and the attendant had already called the police. She became frightened and looked out in time to see her car door open and the guy slip out. The report is that the new gang initiation thing is to bring a woman, bring back a woman and or her car. One way they're doing this is crawling under women's cars where they'll pump it while they're pumping gas or at grocery stores in the nighttime. The other way is slipping into unattended cars and kidnapping the woman. Please pass this on to other women, young and old alike. Be extra extra careful going into and from your car at night. If at all possible, don't go alone. This is real! Exclamation point, exclamation point. The message. This is num- real. This is real. <laughs> exclamation That's how you point. know it's real. Exclamation point. <laughs> it, it then ends with the message. Number one, always, in caps, lock your car doors, even if you're gone for just a second. Number two, check underneath your car when approaching it for re-entry and check in the back before getting in. Number three, always be aware of your surroundings and of other individuals in your general vicinity, particularly at night. Send this to everyone so your friends can take precaution. And guys, all caps, you tell any woman you know about this. Thanks. Oh my God. (laughs) I just want to point out that the thanks is not in cap locks and I appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's like, you need thanks. Mm -hmm. I do also, again, 
nowadays, because tactical influencers are such a thing, men and women are being urged to be worried about kidnapping gangs. But back in the day, this was a more genteel time. So men, nobody's gonna steal you in your car to get initiated into a gang, but you gotta warn the broads in your life. <laughs> oh my God. I love how, you know, because obviously the unspoken thing here is sexual menace uh, in mm -hmm. a, you know, in a racist way because we're talking about gang members quote mm -hmm. unquote but like <laughs> you gotta steal a woman gangs. to be in the they gang any woman <laughs> yeah any, any woman at all any woman <laughs> and her car or maybe just her car i don't know like <laughs> you know it's, it's something but and then it's like yeah. just thinking about being the woman at the gang initiation and you just like five strangers like <laughs> there's Flo from the amp yeah. and here's <laughs> yeah. jessica from the craft store yeah it's Trying so to find funny. Common ground. See, we in Oregon were up until recently immune to this kind of thing because nobody gets to pay at the pump. You know, gas station attendants right. have saved us from these kidnapping gangs. We're the safest people in America, <laughs> mm -hmm. really. It's that's a, that's right. Danger zone in these stories. Yeah, nobody gets kidnapped in Oregon because of the noble gas station attendants. <laughs> <laughs> So the internet had two initial impacts on how chain letter mm. content spread. The first was that it allows a geometric expansion, obviously, in the number of people you can reach mm. with a letter, right? There's just no comparison. The second is that it allowed exact copies to spread indefinitely, mm. Um, mm. which put an end to researchers being able to, like, study heredity with these things to an extent, or at least altered it, right? Because it, it just changes the way in which shit mutates. For a while in the 1990s, it seemed as if the internet might lead to a stagnation for this kind of message. But social media provided impetus for a new generation of sender to make slight adjustments on existing messages in order to build online followings or take advantage of rubes. We see this in pieces, uh, pieces of this in QAnon and Pizzagate, the way conspiracy theories snowball over time due to the participation of huge numbers of people. And this brings me back to today's bullshit conspiracy theories about kidnapping. God knows how many iterations we've seen at this point, but the most pernicious family of myths all focus around the idea that kidnappers stage some sort of item in a victim's car. Sometimes mm. the idea is that this is being done to mark them. Other times it's that when the person stops to remove the item, you know, a shirt that's been left on the hood of their car or a piece of cheese in one version of it, criminals will leap out of a nearby video to gra vehicle to grab them, right? They're trying to distract you. You got to be all always be ready. Keep a hand on your gun at all times. You know, if you Never see a shirt on your cheese. car, just start shooting. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> um, Shoot for a now, seat cheese later. The American yeah, way. That's how that's how I that's what I always say. <laughs> it's worth noting that the specific kind of kidnappings that Phoebe Copas and so many other people today are obsessed with do not happen, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, mm -hmm. you can find freak examples of strangers being kidnapped by strangers, but nearly all trafficking victims, and th these are all wind up being trafficking conspiracy theories, right? That's why they're mm -hmm. trying to kidnap women, right? You know, like that's, that's how it always happens. Uh, the vast majority of trafficking victims know their attacker. They are usually mm -hmm. related to their attacker, right? Um, or to their trafficker, I should say. Mm -hmm. it, it, tra trafficking people being forced into slavery or, or what, or it's like slavery, particularly like sex mm -hmm. slavery. This is not a thing that happens that strangers do to strangers in the United States. This is a thing that like parents do to their kids or like a mm -hmm. guardian. Will do. It's, it is usually either a parent um, who's trafficking the kid for for money, generally as a result of like a drug addiction or like, a a single parent who uh, a, someone comes into their life and then mm -hmm. traffics their kid. It's nearly always someone that the child knows, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's just like the way that trafficking works. And it's the same thing with like when adults are trafficked. It is nearly always, it's either people who are migrants coming to this country being mm -hmm. trafficked in order to like work on farms and shit or, or otherwise do labor um, for very little to no money. Or it is when it's sex trafficking, it's like people being trafficked by, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, by family members. Um, the vast majority of trafficking victims are adolescents or teenagers. 60 mm -hmm. to 67 percent of trafficking victims in the U.S. are 15 to 17 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, a huge number of them are LGBT or gender nonconforming uh, because the it, like one thing that often brings people into trafficking 
They are young. They do not have resources like financial resources. They are kicked out of their homes because they are mm-hmm. queer and they are then forced at some point into the sex trade by somebody that they trust, right? Like mm-hmm. that is when it happens, this is how it actually occurs statistically. Um, no, Robert, the market value of middle-aged women is $4,000 yeah, a no, pound. No, no, it's all it's all like 45-year-old women getting kidnapped at Target. That's how it happens. Mm-hmm. Well, but you could also see, like, right, it's the, the kind of people who fall for this shit are the kind of people who believe in, like, grooming conspiracy theories mm-hmm. overwhelmingly. It, it, and they don't want to hear, no, it's the queer kids that you're spreading conspiracies about are the ones in danger of being trafficked. They want to hear, yeah. like... No, I'm I'm in danger. I have a reason. To, like all of this fear that is ever who are present in me. me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's these dangerous. Yeah, these dangerous looking kids who are going to threaten me. <laughs> the fear that is ever present in my life because human beings, uh, more or less, can't exist without anxiety has mm. a cause, and it's the dangerous, you know, weird looking kids around me who are going to kidnap me by putting cheese on my car. Um, <laughs> and it, it's one of those things. We started this episode talking about Phoebe Copas, but if you do what I have been doing and you spend hours and hours combing through viral Facebook and TikTok posts about like kidnapping conspiracy theories, in every one of them, you will find people talking about their guns. Uh, A representative Mm. example comes from an article I found, 2017 article published by Channel 14 News, an Amarillo, Texas station. And the title of the article was, Woman Finds Shirt on Car, Warning Goes Viral. And obviously (laughs) it's one of these. And right in the, I found a Facebook post that was like 12,000 shares. And one of the first responses was a user going, I keep my pistol in grabbing distance everywhere I go. Like, no, people are not getting trafficked this way. What is yeah. the shirt going to do to you aside from remind you of your dead lover, Jake Gyllenhaal? Yeah, the idea, again, is that like you put a sh- the, these these kidnapping gangs are putting shirts and then you'll take your hand off your gun to go put the, take the shirt off your car. And that's when they jump out and get you. You know, that is the like, thing about these. the like so stupid object rumors, right? Is that it's like you'll you'll in the split second you're distracted, which you can't afford to lose. Mm-hmm. They'll snatch you. And the yeah. idea of having to be that hyper vigilant, yeah, it's fascinating how we're just like selling PTSD, basically. Yeah, and we, and it's, and it's, we know it all too well. And you, well, like it's one one of the things that makes this pernicious is that like no one will tell you you need to be less aware out in public, right? No one's going to say like <laughs> sure. when you get travel to a new city and hop in the Uber, maybe just zone out on your phone, right? Everyone will say, well, yeah, it's good to be you know aware, but. The the version that gets transmitted primarily is like you need to always be hyper vigilant because you are mm-hmm. f- permanently in danger of being kidnapped and sold into fucking taken ass movie slavery. Yeah. Right. Always like, be ready to stop someone with deadly force. That's yeah. A fun way to live. Yeah. You need to be the Liam Neeson, you know, to protect <laughs> yourself from weirdly. Algerian kidnapping gangs, if I'm remembering that movie properly. God knows. Yeah, Liam um, Neeson, who we now know once, well, you know, if you know, you know. If you know, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, it, it, although it, we could talk about his appearance in Atlanta, but this is all outside <laughs> of the point. Um, we're going to keep talking about specifically how these kidnapping conspiracy theories have started and mutated uh, and how this all ties into some other particularly toxic aspects of American culture. By the time these episodes come out, I will have an article up on my Substack stack shatter zone. Um, you can just find it by typing that in about specifically the way in which kidnapping and trafficking as key phrases have become like super reliable ways to go viral on, uh, mm. on TikTok. Um, there's a lot of like weird fuck. So there's this fucking weird, I don't know how to, describe this, but I find it deeply unsettling. One of the first things I found when I was looking into Phoebe, to Phoebe Copas, I decided after I was reading about her, I want to see what people are like saying about this on TikTok. Oh, is and this I, that really scary video you sent me? Yeah, I find this. This is like scary. a type of content where they've they've got take a picture of her and they use it to make an AI video mm-hmm. of her, of like Phoebe, the woman who murdered that guy and have her relating the story of her killing a guy. And like an AI version of her voice and an AI version of her face speaking, it is 
horrible. It's like, so scary. I, Sarah, I'm not a I'm not a moral panic person. Mm-hmm. I don't think TikTok is in I don't think TikTok's any more toxic than all any other form of social media. But mm-hmm. I also think all social media should be made illegal and the people who run these companies pushed into the sea. Like I hate it. I hate it <laughs> this all. This is too much technology. I think that was yeah. the last thing I needed to hear before moving in next door to JD Salinger. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Let's all build look if you're listening to the show Buy a cabin in rural Montana. Learn how to. Okay, actually, this is. I'm doing a Unabomber thing again. See, <laughs> this are. is why. This is why we gotta. We gotta stop. Uh, Sarah, you got. You got anything to plug besides being the Unabomber? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really the main project I'm working on. I do a show called You're Wrong About. We've talked mm-hmm. about human trafficking on it, and I. Mm-hmm. It is like, I don't know. It's incredible to me the magic that that word. Uh, yeah. has the spell that it casts over people it's like and it feels like it's taken the place that the phrase white slavery had in like i don't know this this time a hundred years ago yeah and white slavery is i i didn't get into this for it for this but like yeah if we were to like really dig into that history because like that was in the 1800s and stuff like it was like a, a very easy way to to get people riled up like it's all like uh, Shady uh, fucking um, yellow journalism types have always known mm-hmm. that like, yeah, if you make white people feel like they're about to get abducted off the street because they're always. I think a lot of it goes does go back to, you know, you think about like the emperor in Japan, like mm-hmm. who's like, wow, I was born to rule this land. But I also still, despite all my power and my armies, feel scared all the time. And that's just like mm. a thing that people feel. I'm going to go make all of these pagodas to like spread this because I, I feel like if I spread this, like th- this book says, if I spread this specific chunk of text, then nothing bad will happen to me. The rebels will never come into my palace or whatever. And, you know, then it gets translated to like, wow, I'm a white person in the 1890s. Things are great. We <laughs> rule the entire world, but yet I'm scared all the time. There must be gangs of brown people waiting to kidnap me. And then, you know, and today March it's too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm a suburban American, you know, the most fortunate kind of person yeah. who has ever existed in the history of the planet. Right. I am unfathomably safe and secure. Um, yet I'm scared all the time. There must be a reason for it. And it turns out that's the most profitable thing to, 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 to cash in on. It's, I really, it's, I have not thought of it this way before, but I love your summary that like people just feel scared because that's what we are and what that's we what do. That's what we are. We feel yeah. right. And of course we are. Like we were born to be scared. It's how we've survived this long yes. to the extent that we have to just be like, overly prone to freaking out and then and then the but then it's like once you're in a place of relative prosperity and safety right it becomes like a vestigial or like there's things to feel scared about you know interpersonally whatever you're doing with your life but like that this is also why we have like our great summer movies where it's like you're living a normal life and then you have to fight a dinosaur or a magic truck or whatever else Steven Spielberg has thought up for us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I do love that you gave Steven Spielberg credit for the Stephen King book about the possessed evil truck. Oh, Oh, wait, did Spielberg have a different truck? Yeah. They both, they each got a truck. (laughs) Ah, the Stevens. They've got, they've got a direct line to our amygdalas. The Stevens. They really do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, good stuff. I mean, I feel like, again, for every like powerful impulse in human beings, there's like the good version of tweaking it and the evil version. The evil version is obviously spreading conspiracy theories about kidnapping. The good version is being Stephen King and just doing mountains of cocaine and writing novels that people love and some of which you don't remember evidently so, yeah and yeah. I, I was thinking about this recently with regards mm-hmm. to the satanic panic which as you know i mm-hmm. think about a lot and how yeah. it feels like one of the aspects of the satanic panic is that if you have a religion that forbids you horror media you can't watch yeah. horror movies you can't consume scary stuff except yeah. you know yeah, if you just can't have horror fiction, then like it's going to show up in your religion. It's going to show up in yeah. chick tracts and sermons and your beliefs about what's actually happening because it has to come up somewhere. Yeah, this is why like the horror movie, like people who are actually into horror, right? 
are tend to be like the healthiest folks because they yeah, found an outlet that for that. Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. horror and it is, certainly makes me much yeah. healthier than I would be otherwise. Yeah. This is why John Carpenter is the ideal person, right? <laughs> like that's, there you go. Perfect man. <laughs> that's why Sophie and I are seeing the wicker man later today. Yes. Absolutely. Paragons of yeah. health. Yeah. Paragons of health. And you can be a paragon of health. If you listen to Sarah Marshall's podcast, you're wrong about. Um, it's true. You will see? be. <laughs> you will be. That will solve your problem. And then make that 10 fear, people listen to it. Mm-hmm. All of the fear <laughs> that you is ever present exactly. in your life, it'll go away the instant you start listening to Sarah's podcast. So, so true. <laughs> check that out. Another way you can make the ever present feeling of anxiety that is really just the death motive in your life never leaving you uh, is by subscribing to Sophie. What is our thing called where oh. people don't get ads? <laughs> you can subscribe to Cooler Zone Media or ad mm-hmm. free subscription subscription channel yeah. uh, exclusively on Apple Podcasts, Android version coming very soon. Yeah, everyone who gives us however many dollars a month that costs, uh, your son won't die at the Somme, mm-hmm. you know? That'll, that'll, that's that's the only way to protect him. If you've got a son, those German machine guns are aiming at him, right? This is the only way to save him. And if Give you've us got three dollars. Yeah. Do not let her eat that cheese and Don't warn her, her and cheese. warn her about that the shirt car cheese <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, that's the episode All right. that's part one <laughs> behind the bastards is a production of cool zone media for more from cool zone media visit our website coolzonemedia.com or check us out on the iHeartRadio app apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts